right, well, I'm going to uh, talk to you about um, some work that we're doing in the Sacramento region. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the area, it always looks this beautiful, um, <laughs> except when it doesn't. And by the middle of summer, this will be full of smog. And that's one of the reasons um, I'm talking to you today is the planning that we're doing is addressing multiple issues in our region. And so uh, I'm going to talk to you about two parts of the equation here. First is what we're, do what we're doing in urban planning. And I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on that because it is really important for what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the presentation, which is the rural uh, planning that we're doing in, in our region. And that is through this Rural Urban Connection Strategy Project, or RUCS. Now, um, it's not many regions that put these two together. Okay, so what we're doing is, is somewhat novel in that not many regions do a, a really deep dive into understanding what makes rural er areas economically viable and environmentally sustainable. Um, a lot of time goes into understanding urban growth and how to accommodate that, but the, the, the downside of that is obviously that there's not much time spent on rural. So what we're trying to do in, in our region is put the two together and truly be comprehensive and truly be regional in our, our planning approach. So this is our region, six counties and 22 cities. And you can see why this is important. Look, only 15% of our region is urban and 85% of our region is rural. And yet, up until we did this project, we were focused on what is happening in these urban areas and what are those changes and how does it dictate how we spend our transportation funding. SACOG is a metropolitan planning organization and so we're responsible to, for taking that federal money and spreading it out across the region through a transportation plan and as you know, those, those funds are getting more and more limited, so we have to be very smart and strategic about how we spend them. Um, and again, until recently, we really have focused our attention on what's going on in our urban areas and targeting our money toward there mostly. Um, but 85% of our region is rural, and so it's important for us to think about the rest of the region. Um, even though it's got a low population density, uh, it also has a very uh, up-and-coming, vibrant um, rural economy that I'm going to talk a lot about and that we need to understand better. <clears throat> so first I'm going to start about, I'm going to start talking about the urban side of the equation. And we did this project called Blueprint where we were trying to help people understand how land use policies affect how people travel. Now why is this important? Well, it's important because we didn't used to do that. And we kept, every time we have a transportation problem, we have congestion. Our air quality is getting worse. Um, we, all we would do is throw more money at the problem. We would try to build more roads. And yeah, we would put buses uh, out, in the, out in the transit system and we would build light rail. But none of that was changing anything. Our congestion was getting worse. Our air quality was getting worse. And so we decided to kind of to, to, to turn this on its head. So providing roads and providing transit, that's a supply solution, right? You just keep putting more supply at this and we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of congestion. Well, it's not working. So we went to the demand side and we said, why do people travel? And why do they travel so much? And it's because our region was spreading out. We were sprawling across our region and so people were driving longer and longer distances for work or for entertainment, um, shopping, which I guess is a form of entertainment. Um, and so, so point A and point B were getting farther and farther apart. And we decided to, to look at strategies that were geared more toward putting point A and point B closer together. And that is this idea of growing up and not out, and trying to mix uses together so that you have retail and, and jobs closer to housing. And those ideas are what really underpin this, this blueprint project. Um, and so that's, that's the perspective that we took looking at our region. And what I'm going to show you are, are some results of that. So first of all, this is what our region would look like out to the year 2050 if we continue doing what we're doing. Okay. 
So this, this map was made back in uh, 2003. And so you can see that this red is existing urban, and all of that purple added on would be new development, new growth, out to the year 2050. It's about double the, the, the existing footprint, okay? <coughs> so that's business as usual. Let's just keep doing what we're doing, and this is what we're gonna look like. When, when we showed people this map, they literally freaked out. I mean, they just, they said, no way, we do not wanna look like that. That looks like Los Angeles. We don't wanna look like Los Angeles. So we engaged the, the whole region in a process called the Blueprint, where we sat people down at a table and said, okay, then tell us what you want. And we use that information to drive a conversation about what we are going to be as a region and what that's going to look like in the future. This is what we came up with. Okay, so now this is out to the year 2050. Same number of dwelling units, same number of jobs, same number of people, but on a substantially smaller footprint to the tune of about 230,000 acres. So using these, these approaches to growth, we made a pretty substantial reduction in the impact that we were gonna have on our open spaces in the region. That 230,000 acres, that's mostly farmland. Very little of it is, is not used for farming of some sort. So it's either grazing land or cropland. So 230,000 acres is nothing to sneeze at. The question then becomes, okay, well, what are you gonna do with that 230,000 acres? And that was the question that came back to us. People applauded us for our plan. That this is fantastic. This is a really good result. Not only did we reduce congestion, we also improved our air quality. This, this form of growth cost us about $16 billion less in terms of the cost of infrastructure, the cost of maintaining that infrastructure and services. This also saved us about 20% in water consumption. So we, we achieved our transportation objectives and we achieved environmental objectives as well. We're not using as much water, we're reducing our impact on the landscape. These are all good results. But the question in front of us then became, okay, that's great, but what are you doing with the rest of your region? What are you doing with that 85% that's rural? And we kind of caught, got caught flat-footed. What are we doing with that? And so it started this project uh, called Brux. Now I wanted to say that those results and that, that project, the Blueprint project, um, we, we came up with the final map that was uh, adopted by our board in 2004. But those results have carried forward. Now SACOG is not, uh, we don't have regulatory authority over land use. So that, that Blueprint was just a study was just a recommendation. Local jurisdictions can do whatever they want with that information, but they have embraced those concepts. And as you can see in our current land use and transportation plan, I'm, I'm showing you the land use, land use results here, but those, those principles have carried forward. And so where we used to use 333 acres to accommodate every thousand people, we're now at 42 acres. This is not a SACOG plan. I mean, it is, but it's a plan that we put together in talking with all of our jurisdictions about where they're going, what do they see their growth looking like, how much land are they going to use to accommodate that growth, and this is what we came up with. So this blueprint project has really kind of made its way into the, the psyche of our region about how we think about our future. And by the way, please ask questions if you have them. I, I, let's, let's keep this interactive. So if you, if you see something that you have a question about, it looks like we already have one. So we looked at, um, we have a model that looks at the, the need for infrastructure and the cost of that infrastructure and then the maintenance of that infrastructure and it's based off of the footprint. So what kind of, what's your, what's your urban growth pattern? Um, so it's density, use, um, and those are the two main drivers. What are your uses and what kind of density that are they spread across the landscape at? And then the, the model calculates a, a need for infrastructure and assigns a cost to it. Is it a model that you can share? Or oh yeah, I'll show you, I'll, I'll dig in a little deeper in a few slides and show you how it works. Um, but we've, we've now added to that a, a fiscal component. So then it compares to your fiscal situation and you can see 
how balanced or out of balance you are in terms of, of, of the cost versus revenue that you get out of a land use plan. It's a pretty powerful tool. And it's being used nationally, so, and it's, it's open source, it's free. Yeah. Um, so, I don't want to guess, can you tell me why you saved on water? When you went to less, a higher density, less because, crawl? Because there's less landscaping to water. Right. Okay. It's mainly through landscaping. Right. Smaller lots. Smaller units, smaller, smaller lots require less water. The, the water inside the house stays about the same. It's, it's all the landscaping. So that's the urban side of the equation. Again, that 230,000 acres, that's kind of, that's the linchpin between urban planning policies and what happens on the rural side of the equation. Now, remember that rural economies, at least in, in California, are driven mainly by agriculture and forestry. That is the economy. And land is how, how you make your money. So if you don't have any land, you basically have no revenue. You have no economy in your rural areas. You've become urban, and you're dependent on an urban economy to, to drive your jobs and your economic growth. So that 230,000 acres is a really important result if you want to have agriculture. And we are a region that wants to have agriculture. Um, so it really opened people's eyes and said, oh, wait a minute, what are we doing here? And we've dealt with the, the urban part of the, of the equation, okay? In basketball, there's an analogy. You have an inside game and you have an outside game. Okay, we got our inside game down pretty good. And that's very clear in those results. Now we have to work on the outside game, and that's what this project is. This project is about what are we doing on the rural side of the equation to have a balanced approach to how we're going to grow and change as a region? So that's what this Rex project is all about. Okay, and it's built on, on four main objectives. We have a lot of objectives, but these are the four things that are really driving this project. The first one is enhancing rural economic viability. Okay, so I underline that specifically. Like I said in the past, we've been focused on urban. What's good for our urban economy? That's, that's a good question, and that's one that we're always going to be addressing. But now we're addressing the question of what's good for our rural economy. And so this first statement is really important, enhancing rural economic viability. And then we add to that environmental sustainability. Okay? And the reason that we do it in that order is very important, because it's about following the money. It's about the economy. And if that land is not economically viable, it's not going to be in agriculture. We've seen that over and over and over again. So farmers making money tend to be farmers who stay in business and try to keep that land in production and, and pass it along to their families. They want to see that land in agriculture. But when they're not making money and they've got mouths to feed and kids to send to school and retirement to think about, they become developers or they sell out to developers. And we've seen that in our region and throughout the Central Valley of California over and over and over again. So that, that economic viability part is really important. If the land stays open, then we get the environmental sustainability part. We get that function of providing habitat, recharging our aquifers, sequestering carbon, those other environmental functions that go along with having land open. That second bullet is about understanding what we're facing. Okay, we have a lot of opportunity out there. International commodity markets are hot. I mean, food prices are up. And so there's an opportunity out there. The local food system is hot, and those prices are up. But of course, we have challenges in getting there. In California, that's things like regulations, and water supply, and labor supply, okay? Uh, those are, so we're, we're always constantly dealing with figuring out what our opportunities are, trying to capitalize on those, but at the same time dealing with the challenges that we have to get there. So the way that we are looking at this is by creating data and models to help us test scenarios. Okay, there's a mantra that we use at SACOG that says better information for better decision making. This is how we, this is how we operate our organization. Our board expects us to, to hand to them information that they can use to make decisions. 
And so we're driven to get the best data that we can and use that data in a, in a modeling environment that we can now forecast out different scenarios about what our future may be. And so it's really important for us that when we start thinking about policies and economic development and changes in the marketplace, that we're able to capture that information and analyze it in a way that we can put that in front of our board and help them make decisions about where they want to go. And then the last one, all of this kind of filters down into our role as a, as a MPO to take that information and use it to make investments in the transportation system. We have to be very targeted as to how we spend that money and where we spend that money because we're dealing with limited resources. And particularly in rural areas, we're dealing with very limited resources. So we need to be smart and strategic about that. And so all of this information that we use ultimately comes down to us recommending to our board and, and to members of, of our community throughout the region how we should be planning for and spending our, our money. Uh, and you know that's that's what that's just we do it on the urban side and we do it on the rural side. This is how we do business these days. So a little bit about what agriculture looks like in the Sacramento region. So this top line is the value of the production in our region. And this bottom line is the amount of land in production. Okay, so between 1985 and 2005, we saw both of these lines pretty much declining. I mean, kind of flat and then dropping. And then just dropping the whole time, okay? Land is being consumed for development. The value of production is going down, right? Those are kind of correlated. You need land to have production value. So kind of a downward trend here until 19... Uh, pardon me, until 2005 and 6, downward, downward spiral here. In 2006 and 7, the economy started tanking. Okay, so all of a sudden, we weren't really building anymore. We weren't consuming that land. And at the same time, we started seeing commodity prices go up. So it's interesting. You see here that even from 2006 to 2007, a little uptick in the land in production. All of a sudden, there's money to be made in the agricultural markets. And that land that was laying fallow started coming back into production. And this just kept going. And so you see it kind of flat line here, and then it tick, ticked up again. So this was a signal to us that, yeah, we're on the right track. It's about following the money. It's the economy. And if we can find ways to create more value in agriculture in our region, we're going to continue to see, hopefully, this flat line, if not that fallow land coming, more of that fallow land coming into production. What's actually happening in our region now is that farmers are going into incredibly crummy areas. I mean, marginal soils used mainly just for grazing. And they're figuring out how to cultivate there because there's so much money to be made. So, you know, this, this again told us we're on the right track. It's about making sure that, there's, there, that the landscape is economically viable, that we're tapping into these markets, and that as a region, we're being strategic about how we do that. You got any, are you taking out any freeways or parking lots and bringing those back into production? That's Not where quite all the good yet. land is, huh? Not quite. That's yet. coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so another look at agriculture in our region is through the lens of, of, of employees, OK? This is about 21,000 employees. And we think that this is actually grossly understated, but this is the state economic data that we have access to. Um, we don't necessarily disagree with how it's distributed. So as you can see, I mean, the bulk of the jobs are in support, processing, and distribution. Production is only about a third of the jobs. And that production is producing a farm gate value of about $1.8 billion a year. So that's the, the value of the raw product coming off of the field. When you look at the multiplier effect and you take all those jobs into consideration, we're talking about an industry of over $4 billion a year. And so the question on the table is how do we grow that sector? How do we create more jobs here? And how do we create more value here? That's what our objective is. And there's a lot of strategies to get there. And that modeling that I just talked about helps us test different ways to get there and figure out what's the best path? What's the most lucrative path to get there? Why is this important, sir? Um, what do you mean by support? What uh, types of jobs come under support? Are those farm workers? Or 
that? Uh, seed sales, tractor sales, chemical sales, uh, all that stuff. And then stuff, jobs that people don't normally think about, legal services, accounting, insurance, uh, marketing. So there's a lot of jobs related to agriculture that you know are throughout our communities and you just you don't normally think about that. You think about the guy selling tractors or the guy selling seed, um, but there's plenty of other support services that go along with that. Have you broken down the support into any of the other categories? Because I was curious, um, it seems like the largest component of uh, agricultural Point on uh, um, immigrants or farm workers. So well, that's what percentage is that? But that's just right here. That's just production. And you're right. That's in the production. That's, that's in called production. production. Right. Okay. That's in production, a little bit in processing. But this is all, you know, this is a lot of professional services. And since that still is a significant proportion, um, I mean, the other side of that are the socioeconomic issues. Right. And uh, provision of public services, and, and, uh, and in fact, that relates to other aspects too of, of the other components. So you need to make sure you're counting on both sides of the equation. I mean, you know, it, what goes into what to what extent do uh, public services, utilities, etc., roads um, contribute to, or what is that cost related to agriculture? when compared to other types of, of development. That's right. You're absolutely right. I mean, that's a much harder question to answer, but, you know, to be fair, if the land's not in agriculture and it's, you know, the landscape's covered in houses and industrial uses and, and all that, yeah, there's now a cost associated with that that you don't normally have with agriculture. I mean, one of the, one of the arguments to be made um, in, in support of agriculture is, yeah, it doesn't generate a lot of taxes, but it generates taxes, but it generates almost no need for services. You don't need fire and sheriff, uh, sheriff services or police services, you know, all that kind of stuff. You don't really need that in rural areas like you do in urban. So the service costs are much lower in rural areas than they are in urban areas. What about the environmental costs? Not just the direct costs, but the indirect um, environment, environmental Remediation, or remediation and cleanup costs associated with agriculture. I mean, those are also associated with urban development, but sometimes we forget that they're also associated with agriculture. So yeah, but to a far yeah. less extent. Um, I mean, I would I would argue that yeah, sure, agricul agriculture is a form of development, but it doesn't have the kind of impact on the landscape that urban, you know, the built form has. So, well, every single property mm -hmm. that is being developed for urban development, almost every area I know in the Bay Area, for example, is, uh, has contaminated soils from if there had been previous agricultural production. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's the same with brownfields and former industrial sites, too, mm -hmm. to a greater extent. But you have, um, it, it, it's, you, know, you have the issues, very similar issues. Yeah, see, I, I, I would disagree with you. I mean, there, is, there are chemical residues from agriculture, but most of the contaminated soil in urban areas is, is from leaky, you know, gas tanks and, and, you know, people using chemicals on their lawns. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I'm going to disagree with you on that. I would, I'll uh, agree to disagree on that <laughs> and move forward. And okay. Thank you for the comment. Absolutely. <laughs> So, um, let's see, I lost my train of thought, but I'll, I'll pick up here. So, why is this important? Why is it important for us to have, to think about the whole food system? It's because for every dollar that you spend, only 16 cents of that dollar is going to the farmer. The rest of it is in the food system. So that's aggregation of the food, processing the food, distributing it, marketing, the sales of, of energy, so fuel and other sales, electricity. All of that is where the money is. The money is in everything that happens after you harvest the product. So it's this part of the food system that we're interested in. That's that processing and, and support. That's where the money is. So 
when we talk about growing our agricultural economy, we are talking about trying to figure out what are the most valuable crops to grow out there, but maybe more importantly is what we're talking about is how do we create more jobs out of those crops through the value added process of getting that food onto your plate. And so that's what this project is about, is, is not only about supporting the farmer on the ground, but supporting the whole food system. So when we started this project, this was how we viewed our region, okay? So we have all this great detail about how we're growing our urban areas. What are the economic opportunities in our urban areas? It's all kind of spelled out through the general plans. But the general plans say nothing about agriculture. So if this is a policy document, which it is, and this is what decision makers use to, to dictate what's gonna happen with the land, this doesn't tell me anything about what we're gonna do in rural areas. I mean, what is green? What does green mean? I mean, green can mean agriculture. It can mean open space, which is a pretty generic term. It can mean not urban yet. I mean, we have no definition of green here, except, you know, a, 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 just a handful of things that really don't say much. So what we did is we flipped this on its head, and we said, you know, it's just as important to know on a parcel by parcel basis what's going on in the rural parts of our region as it is to know what's going on in the urban parts of our region. And so we built this crop map on a, on a parcel by parcel basis. And we grow about 120 crops in our region. Now clearly you're not seeing 120 crops here because it would be impossible to read this. And so we collapse this down into crop categories. Okay, so for example, this red here is processing tomatoes. But it's, it's, it's a processing tomato district because that's what they mainly grow there, but they also grow corn and alfalfa and they grow um, soy, um, they grow sunflower, they grow beans, they grow all kinds of stuff. They, have, they, they grow these in a rotation, but the, the main form of their revenue comes out of that processing tomato product. Do you have a question? Did the USDA help you with this information? Or no, we, we built it ourselves. How did you get it? We, <laughs> we worked really around? hard to, so we used um, the, the California Department of, of Water Resources has a crop inventory, but it's terrible, but we started there. Um, we went to the different counties to see what kind of data they had. They have crop reports, but it's not spatially um, uh, displayed like this. We then went to what's called the pesticide use report data. So in California, every time you go to use a pesticide or, or a chemical, you have to register that. You have to say what, what field you're on, and what you're growing. And that's really rich data. That's actually very, very good. So, so that was a good starting point for us, but we still had a lot of blanks. So then we used aerial photography and remote sensing spectral imagery to figure out where, what the gaps are. And then the final pass was we actually drove out to places that we couldn't see at all and did windshield surveys to, to verify the crop. So it took a long time and a lot of money to build this. Fortunately, there's actually much, much better ways to do this these days, and they're a lot cheaper. This cost us about $650,000 to do this. It was very expensive. I, there's a company that I know of in Sacramento now who can do the whole Central Valley of California for $2 million and show, and show a 20 crop profile. So it's hugely valuable. I mean, this is, this is what our project is built on. The technical work is built on this map because behind it, we have all the cost of production studies that it takes to grow all these crops. What does it take to grow rice? What does it take to grow processing tomatoes? What does it take to grow wine grapes? We have all that information behind this. And that is what drives then our analysis of the viability of agriculture. We also use this to start to break up the landscape into the big chunks of what we see going on out there. So for example, all this stuff in these orange circles, that's, that's big scale commodity production. The stuff you see in these blue circles here, that's small scale production for farmers that are trying to sell mainly into the local markets, like the farmer's markets or through the CSA box program. 
Um, these green circles here, this is mostly um, open space, habitat areas, but there is still some um, agricultural production there. And then this purple is mostly uh, production in there. So again, this map helped us start to really look at the landscape more analytically. And from a rural lens, not an urban lens, but from a rural lens, what does our region look like? We also did an inventory of all the, what we're calling agriculture infrastructure. So where are the processors? Where are the, the distribution centers? Where's, where are the seed sales? Where are the tractor sales? Where are all the businesses related to agriculture in our region? And all of this kind of came together as forming the, the baseline or the underpinning of a set of tools that I'm going to show you um, that are really important for us to tell that story of agriculture and use that to then inform our decision makers, uh, inform the, the business community about what the opportunities are in our region. And I will say, I have, I have to say that this is important not only again for you know, the politics and, and decision making at that level, but we have now bankers coming to us and saying, hey, can I get that information from you because I am looking for opportunities to invest in this region. And so it's powerful. It's really important to be able to tell the story through numbers. You had a question, sir? Yeah, I was wondering, um, to what extent does this relate to or has been integrated along with your um, the sustainable community strategy uh, through SB 375? Because I think the COB is yep. primarily responsible. You sound like you're from California. And then associated with that, um, doesn't Sacramento County have um, uh, an agricultural element that's part of their general plan. I know it's not a required element. That's right. I think they have they have one. And then I was wondering about UC Davis' involvement because of their uh, proximity and, mm -hmm. and expertise. So, um, backing up to your first question, this is part of our sustainable community strategy. It's, it's part of the implementation of the land use plan that we have as as, as at SCS, um, so yes, it is, it is part of that, and it's, and it's getting more and more integrated. So our next SCS is gonna have even more of, of this agricultural um, conservation and viability brought into it. Um, as far as the agriculture elements and the general plans in our region, yeah, all, all of our counties now have an ag element. I mean, they see how important agriculture is and they need to plan for that. Um, what was your last question? Oh, UC Davis. Oh, UC Davis. Yeah, I mean, I'm a UC Davis grad. I have three UC Davis grads working for me. Before I even hired them, I was using the, the research done there to, to drive this project. So a lot of the work that you're seeing is, is a result of UC Davis involvement. What part of California are you from? Oh, I... <coughs> San Diego, Ventura, San Luis Obispo, Bay. <laughs> oh wow, okay. <laughs> Two months in Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is the, the suite of tools that we're using for our analysis. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of walk you through these. So I said earlier that understanding our future is, is really how we tell our story and figure out where we're going. You know, is it better to go this direction? Is it better to go that direction? Where do we really want to go as a region? We do that through scenario testing. So let's look five years out and think of some different directions that we may go because we want to go that direction or we, we may go because we're being forced to go in that direction. And so this tool allows us to, to test a bunch of different scenarios and then compare them and say, you know, do we want to go this way? Or what happens if we go this way? What, what are going to be the impacts of that? So that is informed by a model that looks at the big trends in agriculture, national and international trends in agriculture, and how do they come back to the Sacramento region and affect this. I'll talk a little bit about that. We also have a model that looks at what's happening inside of our region. This, this local market um, trend that looks pretty darn good. We think that there's a there there, and so we want to understand. If this continues to grow as a trend, how does it affect our farmers within our region? And, we, and then that feeds into the scenario testing tool. And then this model is it's a little bit of an orphan in this whole scheme, but it is important because small rural communities used to be the backbone of agriculture 
in our region and really you know, throughout this country. It was these small communities where you lived, you bought your seed, your tractors, your insurance, all of that. And if we want to bring this ag economy back to life in our region, and we want to have all that, you know, that other uh, 84 cents on the dollar back in our region, these small communities are very strategically located. They are in the farmland area. And so if you want a new processing facility, we should try to do it here first because it's, it's the closest place to the, to the ag production. The question that we have there is, of course, do they have the infrastructure to support that? And if not, what's it going to cost them to have that infrastructure? And will they be able to, be able to cover those costs? The other question that we have for these small communities is, how do we break them out of this cycle of, of continuing to add rooftops to try to cover the, the cost of, of their infrastructure and their services? They've been on this horrible treadmill of, let's just build some more housing so we can increase our ratepayer base, and then we cover our costs. Well, it doesn't work, because now all of a sudden you have more costs. And so how do we, how do we kind of break them out of that cycle? And, and this model is a way to help us do that. It looks at the cost of infrastructure and the revenue that you bring in from your land use plan and helps you figure out how to balance that. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about this. So that's, that's the suite of tools that we use to look at our rural areas and think strategically about how we're planning for them. So why is this scenario testing important? I, I think we've talked about this enough that I can go straight to the, the, the jugular here. It's about planning, okay? And when we first started this project, we were told don't put the words agriculture and planning together. They just didn't like that. But now they understand why it's important because they see this, you know, this next wave of development coming and they're like, wait, we didn't, we didn't plan for this. We want to plan for agriculture. And so being able to tell stories about what our possible futures are help us plan for agriculture. So that's why this scenario testing tool is so important. So here's how it works. Okay, so a farmer has 2,000 acres of alfalfa and he's doing okay. He makes a farmer growing alfalfa makes anywhere from 1% return, which is kind of a bad year, to 10% return, and, and these days they're actually making more because alfalfa prices are so high. Okay, so 1% to 10% return on that alfalfa. All right, fine, I'm making money, I should be happy, right? Well, this farmer decides he's not happy. He wants to find a new crop to grow, a new opportunity, and he decides that he's gonna go into dried plums or what used to be known as prunes. Okay, so my little story is, he says, hey, I see an aging population. I think that prune <laughs> demand is gonna be up. So I'm gonna put in prunes. And the other story here is that they used to be called prunes, and now they're called dried plums. And I just learned that last year they changed them back to prunes. So call them what you may, but we're gonna call them dried plums for, for this example. So that 2,000 acres now becomes dried plums. Okay, the way the model works, is it says, okay, you've made that change, and once you've paid off that investment, because trees are expensive, and irrigation's expensive, and leveling the land was expensive, so you have all this capital investment in changing that into an orchard. Once you've paid off that capital investment, and once those trees are producing a full crop, look what happens to your value. So the value of your product just went up by $2 million. Now, of course, you have costs involved with that production, so the real value, the real return to you is an extra, now you, you've increased your return by $500,000. Okay, so opportunity, right? Here's an opportunity, but guess what? You also have challenges. Now, this doesn't look like a challenge, right? Wow, you're using less water. That's great. The problem is you have to have water now. You can't. You can't go into a dry year and say, well, I just won't water my field this year. I just won't grow a crop. You can't do that anymore. You have now hardened your water demand. And so even though it's less water, it's, it's water that you have to have if you're going to keep that land in production. You need more labor. Okay, We're suffering from a labor shortage right now. You know, this result says, yeah, you can make more money, but you need labor that you, can't, you don't even have access to. And then for the transportation part of this, we're actually reducing the impact on the roadways 
Yeah, that's a good result, right? Um, so that's how this works. That's how these scenarios help us then think about as a region, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to address this water issue? How are we going to find more labor? How do we support more labor in this region? That's, that's the power of this tool. Opportunity, challenge. And how do you, how do you balance those? And when you think about it, that was only 2,000 acres. What if this starts happening all over the region? And I'll tell you, in our region, it is happening because the walnut market is incredibly hot. And so we've got farmers putting in walnuts all over the place. And in fact, the, wal the demand for walnut trees is so high that you cannot, get, you cannot get saplings until 2015 now. They're all sold out. All the nurseries are sold out. That's how hot walnuts are. So this is, this is real. I mean, this is not dried plums. It's going to be walnuts. But this kind of result is real. We're going, to need, we're going to need water on a regular basis. We're going to need more labor. So as, as planners, as economic development staff, as bankers, we can look at this and say, OK, we want this opportunity. How are we going to get there? And that's, that's what this helps us think about. Question? Yeah. Uh, about the uh, transition from one crop for which the infrastructure already exists to another crop for which the infrastructure may or may not exist, mm -hmm. may or may not be on farm, is that calculated in that? Yes. Sorry, are you thinking mainly about irrigation? No, I'm thinking about uh, storage or drying the plums. If there's yeah. a facility on farm available and what that means, or if there's an off farm. This, so th these cost of production studies do not assume a drying facility on site. So they assume that they're going to a dryer somewhere. So for example, in our region, we have SunSweet. They're huge. They buy almost every, every plum they can get their hands on. Um, and they're not the only one. We have three drying, three big drying operations um, for national and international markets. So most farmers, I would say maybe even all of them, don't have to worry about drying the product. They have they have an easy market to sell into. Sir, um, I wonder how long this current cycle will uh, will last. Because remember, um, had the cycle with the grapes. Yep. Where that just went, boomed like crazy. Yep. In uh, Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino, Lake County. Yep. Where they were converting walnut um, fields to to to, to buyers. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good question. And people have been saying that about almonds for the last five years, but they're still putting more in. You know that, that they sold two billion pounds of walnuts last year out of California? And, there's, and, there's, and they, they predict that they're going to sell more this year because they have more acreage coming online. The wine industry, yeah, they, they had a dip. They're back. Their values are back up. Um, Walnuts are hot because the international demand is going crazy. They can't, they sell everything that they grow. It's, you know, California is, you know, sitting right across from China and they're buying everything that we can grow. And India is buying everything we can grow. I mean, it's, it's crazy. So, so our, they're developing those tastes in those other regions. Yeah, of the world. and fortunately they're developing taste for California products. Right. Because they've had Chinese products and right. they don't want them. They right. want California products. Uh, almond chicken. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's cashew chicken. Okay. <laughs> oh, um, so, but yeah, I mean that's you know, and those are the kinds of things that we want to understand. That that econometric model. I'll show you this in a minute. But we need to bring that information home and say, okay, now what do we do? How do we capitalize on that? And I'll say, look, this is not just California. I mean. You know, you can do it here too. You're more limited into what you can do, but you can still grow pro product for not only your markets but for export. I mean, it's the world is hungry, and you well, know that's what we do do. I mean, it's, yeah, it's almost all commodity. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. You're, you're almost all export, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, we have two days of local food, <laughs> <laughs> so if there's a disruption. And we start using sagebrush then. Mm, yeah. We have a less regulatory environment too, so we're an attraction for large animals. Absolutely. That's why we're losing our dairy industry, we're losing our cattle industry. Um, it's, it's getting too expensive to do business in California. But when you're growing things like nuts, 
and fruits and vegetables um, because they don't have the emissions involved, involved as, as like the dairies and the, and the cattle operations. That's why California is going to stay a, a specialty crop state. Because uh, we can do that stuff way better than, than most parts of the country. Impacted by a longer growing season. Right, right. Favorably impacted. Yeah, right. I mean, the, the climate that we have in California is just, you know, it, there's only a couple of Mediterranean climates in the world, and we're fortunate to have one of them, and a, and a big chunk of it. And that's what's so sad about, you know, the fact that we also have to contend with this regulatory environment. It's, it's tricky, but you don't see a lot of businesses going away. You see processors going away. We're losing our processing capacity in a big way because the processes are being regulated out of the state, right? Water quality, air quality, OSHA, all that stuff is it's just becoming insurmountable. And so they're starting to go over the border and look at there. A lot of them are moving to Arizona. Some of them are starting to move to, to Nevada. And you know, it's just, it's odd that they would truck their product that far because of, of regulations, but that's what's happening. So one of the things, and I'll, and I'll get to this, but one of the things, all of this information helps us make a case for regulatory reform. And, you know, because we can say, look at this opportunity, but you can't do it for this reason or that reason, or it's gonna cost too much here or cost too much there. We hope that this is a, a path for us to start working with regulators to, to work on trying to still achieve the objectives that they have with the regulation, but do it in a way that doesn't cost as much money. Um, I'm gonna let, you only get two more questions. Okay, this is <laughs> obvious <laughs> counterpoint. Um, you know, do we want to be like China? I mean, are you- No, I mean, we never that? will be. Because part, part, part of our marketing that is, is we move backwards as far as, because when you talk about regulatory reform, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you look at just thinking about the vineyards, okay, the grape growing, I mean, that resulted in, because of its speed and ramp up so quickly, they had major problems with water quality and erosion um, and with the conversions, especially the newer conversions from open space to, to, uh, to grapes. And so um, there, there are serious issues with water quality alone with, with um, agriculture, different types of agriculture. Um, the dairy industry, after years of, of, um, uh, of serious air pollution issues, or I'm sorry, um, you do have that, but I think the water pollution issues are much more of a concern. Um, they started um, with the recent reforms, and you're right, they're much stricter than Idaho's. Mm -hmm. But does that mean that <coughs> you should, you know, uh, aspire toward the Idaho model of water, water uh, of environmental regulation and enforcement. Well, okay, I hear what I said, though. made significant improvements. Hear, hear what I said, though. Yeah. Achieving the same standards but not doing it with, with all the paperwork and the redundancy. I mean, there's a well, lot sure. of redundancy no, in the regulatory system. I mean, I don't want to get into a regulatory okay. philosophical argument with you, but there's, the reality is that... There's, there's another way to do it that might there's be There's another way to do it, and, you know, look, Guess what's going to drive this? The cost of doing business, because chemicals are expensive, water's expensive, you know, nitrogen, which is a big issue right now in California, it's expensive to put that stuff on the ground. And guess what else is driving this? Costco, Walmart, Safeway, they all want sustainable products. So, you know, the growers now are saying, state of California, you're easy compared to what I have to do for Costco. So. You know, the market is changing the way that farmers do business. And then on top of that is this whole new marketplace in environmental services. You can't have environmental services if you're polluting the ground and you're polluting the water and you're polluting the air. So they see, they see opportunity there. The market will take care of this. I mean, I'm, I'm fairly confident. We have to kind of push things along every once in a while. But I'm telling you that it's changing out of necessity. So again, back to these results and bringing them up to a regional level. This is return on investment across our region. This is labor needs across our region. So, so think about this. If, if you see this map and you know that the dark spots are where we need a lot of labor and you're, you're trying to think strategically about where do you put housing and where do you put transportation services, 
right? This looks pretty good. I mean, we have a lot of labor that, that goes into this area on a regular basis. All the vineyards are down here. There's a lot of labor there. Oops, going backwards. So, so now, again, with this limited money, we can be more strategic about how we make these investments. Same is true on transportation. This is the truck trips being produced that are taking product to market. This area is a hot spot. So if we're going to prioritize and target our investments, that looks like a good place to start. Okay, and as a region, this is how we want to think about things, sir. How big a geographic area? 4.2 million acres. So besides truck traffic, do you use any other forms of intermodal traffic to move? For agriculture, right. not really. It's all by truck. Um, we have a port that is right here. So all the, a lot of these trucks funnel down into this port because it's going out to international markets. Um, and we do have rail in the region, but it's not. It's it's moving ag product once it's aggregated somewhere. And then water. Again, same thing. How much water? Where are we using it? Do we have the infrastructure to support changes in the water needs? particularly in dry years. If we have to go from surface water to groundwater, and, and we're monitoring our groundwater, I mean, this is all rice right here, okay? It needs a lot of water. It's a highly high value crop. So, and they rely on surface water, but if they don't have surface water, we can think now, okay, how do we make sure that we still are gonna grow this high value crop? How much groundwater would, do we have to tap in to do that? Is that sustainable for our region? We couldn't answer that. We couldn't even ask those questions before. But we had no way to look at it. That's again the power of, of these tools. Helps us be strategic in a in a very regional sense about what we're doing with our assets. Okay. Here's another way to use this tool. Are there any farmers in the room? Any farmers? So how would you answer that question? Yes. You would. Oh yeah. Wow, you're you're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would too, but I would do it. Um, I think it depends on what type of farming that you're going to do. I'm working with some a, a, a group of people who want to do some hydroponic tomato farming. Mm -hmm. Lower impact on water usage, less ground, yep. longer growing period. I think it's just a matter of what perspective that you're looking for. Right. Well, let me, let me show you why this is an important question. And I think you'll agree, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to be so flippant, but, um, you know, a lot of farmers in our region say no. They say no, and here's why. Okay, so this is Yolo County in our region, the, the western part of our region. Look at all, this is return on investment, okay? So red is good, that's 40% return or above. Pink is 30 to 40, black 10 to 30, okay? Gray is zero to 10, and then white is no return. That's all your grazing land. Grazing is still doing horribly in California. Um, this looks fantastic, right? I mean, if I, if, if I was an investor and I saw this, I'd be like, line me up. I mean, I'm ready to go. But notice, you have no establishment cost whatsoever, okay? So you're not buying tractors, you're not building sheds, you're not putting in irrigation systems. You have no establishment costs. You have operating costs, that's factored in here, but you have no establishment costs. How realistic is that? You're putting, you're putting money into your farm every year, right? Some sort of capital investment. So what if it's 10%? What if you're putting in 10%? So let's say it costs you $1,000 an acre to start your farm. You're putting in $100 an acre every year. Maybe you're putting in only $50 an acre, but you're still putting money in. You have to fix a tractor. You know, you have to put in a new shed to house that tractor, whatever. You're always putting money into your operation. Look what happened to the returns just at 10%. Nothing's red now except these farms in here that are selling product to the local market. Okay, and I want you to look at this part right here. Okay, this is rice production. So just at 10% establishment cost, rice is no longer making money. Now again, this is on last year's prices. Rice prices are way down. So these guys, if they had to plow 10% back into their operations, they'd be breaking even at best. Okay, what if you go to 30% of the establishment cost? Okay, now you're at that, 
you know, thirty, three hundred dollars uh, per acre rather than a thousand. Look at everything started. All the alfalfa dropped off the map. Pardon me. All the grains dropped off the map. Um, the rice is gone. We have alfalfa and processing tomatoes basically left making money. Okay, now you're at forty percent. The only thing making money is processing tomatoes and these small locally serving farms. What about sixty percent? Nothing's making money except these small locally serving farms. So the story here, and again, this is the power of these tools, is that those farmers out there that are already in operation, that have, that have established themselves and are putting crops in the ground every year, we've got to keep them in business. Because who's going to come in and start a farm when even at 60% of the cost of establishing that farm, you're not going to make any money? You've got to have deep pockets and a lot of patience to, to come in and say, yeah, I want to farm. And I think that's true with most farmers, is that they say, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bite it for five years, if not longer. It takes time to make money. And you know that really eliminates a lot of people out of agriculture. That's what's happening to our beginning farmers these days. You know, the average age of a farmer is 60. If you're a young person coming into agriculture, this doesn't look very good. That's a bleak future. So we, we've got to keep those farms on the ground. We've got to keep them in operation. We've got to figure out how to transition them into the next generation. Otherwise, this is what we're going to be looking at in terms of agriculture, a big you know, blank canvas. OK, so I talked about looking at these big trends and how they affect us here at home. OK, so world commodity markets are, they can help or hurt us. OK, so think back a couple of years ago, Russia was having a drought. And then they had a big fire that burned, what, a quarter or more of their grain supply? The next day, grain prices doubled on the world marketplace. Okay, That's the kind of stuff that we're talking about. When you see things like that happen, it's like, hey, opportunity. I'm going to grow wheat. And that year, the wheat production in our region went up substantially. So let's look at this, this tomato um, processing tomato production area as an example. OK, so that's our crop type. And here's our scenario, fuel prices double. So what do you think's gonna happen? Okay, well. Price of ketchup will go up. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> but in terms of agricultural production, this is what it looks like on a normal basis. This is the rotation for tomatoes. Um, we have, in that rotation, we, we see about 6%, maybe sometimes 7% of, of that land fallowed. It's just part of the rotation, or maybe there's some other reason. When fuel prices double, it's more expensive to do business. That triples. That fallow land triples. Okay. So now, seems pretty straightforward, right? The planning question is, okay, what do you do with that? What are our strategies as a region to now go in and figure out how we're going to make money on that fallow land? That's, that's why this model is powerful and important, is because we then take that and we go back to our scenario tool and we say, well, what if we put in blueberries? Or what if we put in alfalfa? Or what if we put in something? You know, name your crop. And turn the crank on the model and say, OK, hey, we're, we're making money again. Even under, these, even under this environment where fuel prices are double, we figured out a way to make money. That's, that's again, why these tools are so important. OK, we're going to switch gears. We've been talking about kind of production scale agriculture. I'm now going to switch gears and talk about this local food um, movement, right? Creating a local food system and really more importantly, a regional food system. Okay, so in our region, we produce, bless you, we produce about 3.4 million tons of food a year. Okay, sounds pretty good, especially when you consider that we only eat about 2.2 million tons of food. So look, we can feed ourselves. Here's the reality. Not even 2% of what we eat in our region is coming from our farmers. Okay? Because if you live in, in our region and you want to eat the food that's grown in our region, your diet's going to be rice, processing tomatoes. Uh, you might, you'll, get, you'll get some nuts and you'll get some fruit and you'll wash it down with wine. The prunes. <laughs> prunes. So, Don't forget the prunes. The prunes, yeah. Stone fruit. That's about it. 
we don't grow a lot of leafy greens. We don't grow a lot of vegetables. Um, you know, we don't grow the stuff that you are accustomed to eating on a regular basis. So if that's the diet that you eat, you should move to Sacramento. You will be in, you'll be in high cotton. Um, so that's the reality. We have trucks moving products that are passing on the highway all the time. So the question to us is, how do we, how do we change this? How do we start internalizing that food system? So what we produce stays in the region and taps into that other 84 cents on the dollar. Because again, we're only getting 16 cents on the dollar for this production. So when you spend a dollar, we only get 16 cents of that. We want more. And the way we get more, we think, is through starting by feeding ourselves and capitalizing on the opportunities to not only grow the food, but then aggregate it, process it, distribute it, market it, insure it, all of that happening in our region. So there's the 2%, right? Farmers markets, community supported agriculture, a little bit of sales to supermarkets. That's about it. Or at restaurants. That's it, that's the 2%. Some of our farmers are starting to get smart. They're saying, hey, I want to get into bigger markets. I'm gonna, I'm gonna team up with a few of my fellow growers out there, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start building uh, some, some bigger supply, more variety, more volume. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start aggregating. This is particularly true for those, those farmers that are doing these CSA boxes. They want to have a more diversified box, and so they really have to start teaming up to do that. Sorry, what's a CSA? Community supported agriculture, so it's a subscription. So you pay me on the promise that I'm gonna give you a box of food every week. Oh. And it's usually about, I mean, it t depends, 20 to 50 bucks a box, depending on what you're getting and how big it is. So, that's great, but really, if we're gonna to get to that 20% mark, let's say, or 50% or whatever, whatever your target is for how much food you wanna eat locally, this is really what you need. You need to start thinking as a region about the types of production, the seasonality of your production, how you're gonna aggregate that, what markets you're gonna tap into. I mean, we're talking about a food system, much like you get food today, but it's scaled and targeted within the region. So this is, this is kind of our, what, we're, what we're doing a lot of, of research on. And it looks something like this, okay? So food system analysis, okay? Production, right? Farm, consumption. Oops, gosh darn it, this thing is. Okay, so farm, market, to. Farm to market. Some people call it farm to fork. Did you know that Sacramento now is the farm to fork capital of the United States? Our mayor, Kevin Johnson, former MBA star, has designated Sacramento as the farm to fork capital. You know what's ironic about that? There's no food production in Sacramento. So he finally got the message and said, the Sacramento region is the farm to fork capital. <laughs> It's still good. I mean, it's, it's still a, a good objective, and it highlights the fact that we can feed ourselves. So farm to fork, or farm to market. Okay, so I showed you earlier, we know, we understand the production side, okay? We know what it takes to grow food and to make money at that. I will show you in a second that we've now got tools that help us understand how much land do we need to actually feed ourselves. The part that's missing is we, it's this infrastructure, it's perplexing. If this is such a hot idea, why don't we have people aggregating and processing food at a local level? Regulation. What did Carville say to Clinton? It's the economy, stupid. No one can figure out how to make money here. So we have funding from the California Strategic Growth Council and from the U.S. Department of Agriculture to try to figure this out. And I'll tell you, I'll be completely honest with you, we're going to find some things that work really well, and we're going to find other stuff that doesn't. Because if it worked, this would be, you'd see this everywhere. So the problem is that no one has ever really truly analyzed it down to, you know, an accountant or business level about what it takes to make these kinds of operations work at a regional scale. So that's what we're charged with doing with these grants that we got, is figuring out how to make this work. If you can figure this out, all of this works. 
I mean, is it like, you know, whatever they call it, you know, like reverse engineering? I mean, that, that's obviously how it used to be. So, yeah, so but, but, you know, people also used to pay more for food. We don't, think about this. I don't have these numbers exactly right, but we used to pay, it was something like 12% of our household budget was spent on food, 6% was spent on health care. Those have flipped. Okay, now we spend 6% on food, 12% on health care, and growing. So we, the household budget doesn't support a system that costs more money. And that's one of the, that's one of the problems with this. We could make this work if people over here paid a higher price because these farmers need a higher price because they're, they're not producing the volume that you produce when you, know, you go to Kern County and 95% of the carrots per, eaten nationally come from one county in California. Heck, when you're, when you're producing that kind of scale, you can take pennies on the, on the carrot and you know, still make money. You can't do that when you're growing at a smaller scale. So that's, you know, there's this tug of war between, you know, right, cost, right. Of, cost of production and, and the price that people are willing to pay in the market. Right, right. I mean, there was a reason why it went, why a lot of things have moved to centralization because oh, of yeah. that economy. I mean, our food system is kind of a race to the bottom right now. How cheap can I buy that bag of carrots? <coughs> and if I'm going to sell you a bag of carrots for $10, and the, the guy over here who's selling them locally is going to sell it to you for 13 Which bag of carrots are you going to buy? Right. Well, what you have to say is what are the, the hidden costs in that bag of carrots? You know, yeah. are you draining the Colorado River dry? Are you totally messing up the Bay Delta? Are you uh, pulling, you know, hurting anadromous fish in the Snake River? You know, what are you doing? Right. You know, and that has to It doesn't to go say that on the bag. No, I know. No. <laughs> and, 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 and it has to go into the equation because it all doesn't, it doesn't yeah. boil down to saying that local is better across the board. On right. You're talking about full cost accounting or social accounting, and we don't do that. But, I mean, if you're talking about just trying to make sure you have economic viability, uh, agricultural economic viability and environmental sustainability, yeah. then you're... Right. Yeah. No challenge. Kind of back on topic. Um, there are programs here in our state between the Idaho Department of Agriculture with their specialty crop grants, mm -hmm. as well as to the Department of Commerce for infrastructure, mm -hmm. through their iGEM grants and things like that. Does your area have that same? Because there are programs here that are available. It's only on the public infrastructure side. I mean, they can't take it, but they can get the um, electrical distribution to your property line. Right. They can get the right. road to your property line. Right. They can get you those extra funding. So there are programs here to help new or existing farmers wow. stay in in business. Yeah, and we have some of those too. But you know, the challenge that we have is farming in California is really expensive. Right. Land, just land alone, is ridiculously expensive. And then the other problem is that the USDA categorizes California mostly as metropolitan. So and we so can't, we can't tap down. into those funds. Yeah. I mean, so our state director for rural development is a great lady. She's a friend of mine. And she is completely frustrated that she cannot help our region because we're considered metropolitan. She can help certain parts of it. But when it comes to things like, like you said, like building that infrastructure and right. you know helping that pencil out, can't do it. Yeah. Not unless it happens in a rural community that's under you know twenty thousand people. Yeah. So that's one of the challenges we have. Um, so that's the system. That's this is what we use to, to think through how we're how we're going to understand and study and and strategize around this food system. Um, so this pro forma tool and business plan, these are important. And again, like I said earlier, we, we fully expect to find things that don't work. But at least now we know, right? Instead of being in the dark, we can say, okay, here are things in our region that work, and here are things that don't. So now we can put our effort into this. Let's now find that next round of funding to study how we make this part work. That's how we're going to solve this problem, hopefully. Okay, so I, I mentioned earlier that we have a way to figure out what does it take to get to certain percentages of food production in our region that is local or regional. So if you want to go from 
to 20%, we've calculated that you need 88,000 acres. Okay, we look at the diet that people are eating, and we look at the production of that food, and we basically back calculate and we say, okay, you need this much acreage to produce this much food for people to eat in the region. So it's a pretty nifty little tool. It was developed for us at UC Davis, and you know, it tells a great story. Okay, so now you go back to thinking about your scenarios. Okay, if we want to be 20% local, where do you get 88,000 acres? Okay, we've got some fallow land. We've got some crops that we probably have to convert. We've got huge schoolyards with a bunch of grass. Let's turn those into gardens, maybe, right? Educational components to schools. We have churches with huge, huge yards. Let's turn that into production. We've got community gardens. We've got parks that are just full of lawn. I mean, we have all this inholding within our urban areas that is capable of producing food. So, you know, you start to get creative and strategic about what are you doing to produce food for yourself, and you start to come up with a, a fair chunk of land just inside your urban areas alone. And then as you move off into the, into the other the rural parts of the region, what's fallow, what's underutilized, you know, what has access to water? I mean, again, these, these data, these results are helping us be more critical and strategic about what we're doing to hit this mark. Oh gosh, I'm Okay, what are we doing to hit that mark? And now this one, okay, now we start to get, it's, this is tough, right? 220,000 acres to get to 50%. I don't know, that's a tough one. Because we, because our production agriculture is very strong and healthy and tapped into markets, you know, maybe we'll get there someday, but it's going to be, again, it's the economy, right? We, gotta have, we have to have farmers who say, okay, I'm going to take the plunge. That's tough. If you're, if you're an alfalfa grower, and now all of a sudden you're going to grow 50 different vegetables, that's a whole new world to you. There's a huge learning curve. And you have to capitalize that operation. So, you know, we need to we need to set our expectations and manage those expectations. Um, this goal looks pretty good, twenty percent. And, and actually, the mayor put that out there too. Kevin Johnson again said, "Let's get to twenty percent by 2020." I don't know if we're going to get there by 2020, but you know, let's get to twenty percent. And then on the on the production side. Again, this is important, right? Markets and revenue and scale. We gotta, we gotta think about this strategically. You know, we have a lot of people who say, we're gonna feed ourselves with a bunch of 20 acre farms. They have this very, you know, kind of um, utopian concept of farm to fork, a bunch of 20 acre farms. Well, the reality is that a 20 acre farm is gonna do best when they're selling directly to the consumer. So the way you read this is, these are different market bundles, okay? So the green here, oh gosh darn it. The, the green here is high-end wholesale. So these are the, the wholesalers who are doing organic products. So they, they, they're, charge, they're paying more and charging more. And then this blue here is conventional wholesale or institutions, so schools, hospitals. Um, and so as you, as you start to move into these markets, you're going down in price, okay? So these are different market bundles. This is all direct to the consumer. This is starting to sell into the wholesale market, but it's high end. This is, now you're taking wholesale and you're going into institutions and conventional wholesale, okay? So a 20 acre farm, they can make $100,000 if they know what they're doing. So these are, these are farmers who can get the maximum yield out of their land they're growing year-round, and they're selling directly to the consumer. They can make $100,000. This is not unrealistic. I know a farmer growing on eight acres making $60,000 a year. He's a kid. He's a kid. And you know what he did? He tapped into the San Francisco market, and now he sells directly to, to, to restaurants there. He's killing it. He's like three years out of college. Okay, $40,000? Mm, maybe. Right, maybe I'll, I'll live on that. $4,000, forget it. Okay, but if you're a 60 acre farm, okay, now you have more options. Okay, you can make $300,000, and that's what most of them will probably do, 
But remember that farmers markets are only about, they're less than 1% of what people are eating or, or buying, okay? So you can only do so much here before you start to run out of, of options for getting rid of your product. Now you're gonna go to wholesale, okay? If you get rid of it all here, okay, you made 175,000. If you had to start getting, gosh, I don't know, this too sensible. If you have to start getting rid of product at, at this wholesale level or institutional level up here, you're down to 100,000, but you're $100,000. I'd like to make $100,000 on 60 acres. I mean, that's not bad. I got rid of all my product, right? I've got new markets because these guys want my product. They really do. And I have, so I can, I can basically, I, if there's no other farmers doing this, I'm doing really well. So again, the story here is, how are we going to feed ourselves as a region? We can do, you know, all these farms have a place in our food system, but we have to be realistic about what markets they're gonna sell into. And if we want our schools and our hospitals to be able to get product from our farmers in the region, we're not, we're not talking about 20 acre farms, we're talking about large scale operations that are gonna be able to sell high volumes of product at low prices and be able to still make money. That's how the food system works today, all we're doing is changing the target. Instead of selling it outside of our region, we're selling it inside of our region. That's really all we're doing. Did you have a question, sir? Okay. Okay, so distribution and process, and I keep talking about this, these are the missing pieces. Um, again, volume, it's all about volume. The bigger the market, the more volume you've gotta have. Pretty simple. That's where that aggregation distribution is important. One of the questions on the table is, can we use our existing distributors to do that? Maybe. They don't necessarily want the competition. But if they get a piece of it, they might, they might play. On the processing side, product diversification is really important. Farmers make more money when they diversify their product mix, when they add value to it. So that processing is critical. And particularly when you have distressed product, if you're a peach farmer and your peaches are starting to get soft, you want to you want to put them into something that is going to be more shelf sit stable. Dry them, jams, jellies, pies, whatever. Get rid of that product. Process it into something that you can sell. Okay. And again, back to our customer base. If I'm a school, I don't chop lettuce. I don't cut fruit. Someone does that for me. So I need that processing to have products that I'm used to putting on the plate. Hospitals are the same way. Schools, hospitals, correctional facilities, nursing homes. All of those facilities, high volumes of food, great customer base, but they need food that's already processed. Again, the question is, can we use our existing processing infrastructure to do this? I think the answer is kind of no. That's why we're, we're looking at rescaling um, these systems to be more local and regional. Because these guys are doing, the processors that we do have left in our region are big. We have blue diamond almonds. They're huge. We're not gonna go in with a ton of almonds that are local and have them process them and put them in cans and say locally grown. They just don't do that. So again, back to this pro forma and feasibility analysis. Really important. This is, this is gonna be I think one of the most important things we end up doing in this project is figuring out how do we make these systems connect. Now I want to offer you some perspective too, this, and this is really important. I don't want you to think that we're putting all of our energy into trying to make local and regional food systems work. We think it's important, we think there's opportunity, and we'd like to see them work, and it's not just because we want to eat locally, it's also because <coughs> small businesses turn into big businesses, okay? So there's, um, do you guys know Amy's Frozen Foods? Okay, you know how Amy's Frozen Foods started? There's a couple of people in the Bay Area who were kind of cooking up stuff and trying to sell it to people locally. They're now nationally distributed. <coughs> okay, so that's what we're talking about. They started small. Okay, we have, in, in our region, we have the biggest community supported agriculture operation in the nation. They sell 25,000 boxes of food every week. Okay, they started off as a 40 acre farm in what's known as the Cape Bay Valley of, of, of Yolo County. 
40 acres. They're now 1,600 acres selling 25,000 boxes a week. These guys are making money hand over fist. So, you know, I want you to, I want some, you to have some perspective on this, that even though we're talking about these local and regional food systems, we're talking about creating opportunity to get big. And, you know, that starts off usually at a small scale. Okay, the other thing that we want to maintain is the identity of our food. Where is it coming from? It came from the Sacramento region, and it's a high quality product, and that's why you should buy it, and that's why you should pay a premium for that. That's what we're trying to get at here. Okay, the other thing that we're doing is we're looking at the opportunity of food banks as a way to start this system of aggregating and distributing food. Okay, and if you think about what a food bank does, it really makes sense. Food, get, food banks bring in a bunch of food, they sort it, they aggregate it. So they aggregate it, they sort it, and then they distribute it out. They have cold storage, they have trucks, they have people driving those trucks, they have people sorting food, they have people working in the warehouse. So all of those costs that are involved with putting this kind of thing into operation, they've already got. So if we want to start thinking about and, and actually getting active about aggregating and distributing food at a, at a local and regional scale, it's already there. These guys have capacity in their warehouses. They have capacity in their cold storage. Now they don't have enough to start doing hospitals and schools, but they have enough to show people, you know, kind of prove this, the proof of concept, okay? This is how it works. These, these are the farmers that are lining up to supply us. These are the, cu the customers out there buying from us. And how do we go from here to something bigger? And that's part of what we're working on, is figuring out what's our entry point where we, where we will actually make money in aggregating and processing food, and then how do we scale up from there? So we've hired economists to help us figure that out. Okay. Part of this is also farm to fork, we have a, one of my board members has a really great way of putting this, that it should be farmed to all forks, okay? We've got all kinds of people in our region who have no access or hardly any access to fresh, healthy food. So when we think about our food system and eating locally, we're also trying to think about this, this idea of food deserts and getting food into those places. We've been able to map out the food deserts in our region, and as you can see, it's kind of, you know, kind of ugly in some places. The, the darker the color is the population density. Okay, so this is when you're walking, biking, or using transit. If you think about poor households, that's their main form of transportation. If you add cars into this, much of this goes off the map, but a lot of these households don't have cars. Or if they do, they don't run. Um, so we're trying to figure out how do we get food into these areas? Again, back to the food banks. So the Sacramento Food Bank, actually now they do mobile distribution. People don't go to the food bank anymore, the food bank goes to them. So they take trucks out to neighborhoods to set up basically a farmer's market and they give out food. And so that model, coupled with this sourcing from local growers, can get us into these kinds of neighborhoods and get food out there. Now this is clearly not a money maker, okay? But this is part of what it means to be a, a region and a community is that we're going to be, we're going to try to get food, healthy food to all people, not just those who are going to pay top dollar. And we also want to understand what people are eating. We are, the, the analysis that I showed you earlier about taking the diet and turning it into land in, in production was based off of national numbers for food consumption. I'm telling you, Californians don't eat like the Midwest, they don't eat like the East Coast. People eat differently. We have huge ethnic diversity in our region. We're actually one of the most diverse regions in, in the country. So there's a lot of food that we didn't capture in that survey that can be grown in our region and served out to people. We just don't know what it is. So surveying people about their diets is going to be really important. And you know what's sad <coughs> is that we went to the public health organizations and said, tell us what people eat. You, you should have this information. And you know what they give back to us? Well, they eat a cup of fruit, they eat three ounces of meat, they, eat a, they have a glass of milk. That doesn't help me. What kind of fruit? What kind of meat? What kind of grains are they eating? They don't, they don't have that information. So 
we're, we're setting off to try to figure out a way to, to get more detail about what people are actually eating. And again, this is important for public health, but it's also important for our farmers to know what crops should they be putting in the ground. If we have, so we have a big Hmong community in the Sacramento region. Okay, well how much Chinese cabbage do they use? I don't know. If we knew that, we could be able to say, okay, here's a market, I'll put in, you know, 10 acres or 15, 20 acres, 20 acres, whatever, whatever it takes to grow Chinese cabbage for that market. But right now, we're blind, we don't know. Okay, switching gears again a little bit. Now we're gonna go to the east of our region and go up into the Sierra Nevadas. About 28% of our region is, is forested. Um, but we have a problem. <laughs> and that is that we've been seeing timber harvests on a serious decline uh, since the 90s. So this is harvesting on national forest land, and this is harvesting on private land. I mean, we're just, we're losing our production capacity like crazy. So all of our mills are shut down except one now. We have one mill left and our forests are becoming overgrown. So when California was settled, there was about 150 trees per acre. We're now 400, 500 trees per acre. No wonder why we have catastrophic forest fires. And no wonder why those fire forest fires are happening more and more frequently. Um, so we have a problem. And you know, this is, this is a, a map of the, the fire intensity or the fire threat in our region. Um, orange is not good. Yellow is moderate. But the yellow is where we have, it's mostly granite. So anywhere you have trees, you basically have a very high threat of forest fires. So what we're looking at are strategies to try to deal with this. And, and you know what's interesting is that when we convened people to talk about this, that was the first thing that came up. They don't work together. They don't work together. And they need to because they've got serious problems, but they've also got major opportunities. Forests, healthy forests, sequester carbon, which you can sell on the, on, the, on the market. California has a market for carbon. So you can sequester carbon and then sell those credits. Healthy forests produce better quality timber, which you can get a higher price for. Healthy forests produce better quality water and more water, because it doesn't wash down the hill. It actually soaks into the ground and then comes out through the springs and the rivers in a cleaner form and, and in a more timely release. So there are all these benefits that go along with better forest management. The problem is that these people haven't been working together. Okay, this ecosystem services and getting payments. Okay, that's again that's that carbon sequestration, providing habitat, providing water quality. You can get paid for that, but you you have to be able to first say I have a management strategy and to quantify what it is you're, you're actually providing that I'm going to pay you for, and we're just not there yet. And then really trying to figure out how do we rescale our, our mills and other infrastructure and forestry to, to serve a different market. We're not gonna compete with Canada. They can outcompete us these days. We're not gonna compete with the Northwest for that matter because we're, we're so regulated. So what are the markets that we can compete in and how do we retool our operations to, to be more nimble around those markets? That's the kind of conversation that we need to have in our region. This was identified by the st stakeholders up in, our, up in the Sierra Nevadas as the things that we need to work on. Okay, land use. Now, none of this really makes a, amounts to a hill of beans or rice or tomatoes or anything else if we don't protect the land that is growing this food and growing this timber. Okay, so here's one of the problems, right? Conflict. People don't like living next to agriculture, then don't move there, right? I mean, it seems pretty simple. But people want this bucolic lifestyle and all this open space. And it's fantastic, right? I mean, that's how I grew up, and I, I really miss it. But you have to then also deal with the fact that it's noisy, and it's dusty, and there's chemicals, and right? That's agriculture. And, but, but you know, going the other direction, Farmers don't like people driving on their roads, and they don't like their pets. They don't like the fact that they, you know, that seeds from other plants blow into their property. I mean, they don't like that stuff. And this last one has become a huge deal. The theft and vandalism is just, it's just gone crazy. I mean, people, they're looking for copper, and they're tearing things apart to get at it. So, um, you know, this is the conflict. And what's happened is that 
you know, we go from an average rate of fallowing of six, seven, eight percent to, you know, three times that, four times that, and more when you get to the edge, right? People, it, it's, it's shutting down operations. It's, it gets that bad. Now, of course, there's also speculation going on at the edge, so that contributes to this rate of power. Farmers just don't want to deal with it anymore. They just, they just, basically, they just move on to, they just move away from the edge and go find another piece of land to farm. They just don't want to deal with it. So, the problem with this is that it's kind of this cycle, right? Because when land goes fallow, you're no longer making money on it. When you're not making money on the land, then you look for the next opportunity. And particularly when you're next to an urban area, that next opportunity is, guess what? Urban development. So it just starts to cycle. And so we, we're trying to figure out how do you break this cycle? How do you start getting production back on these lands in here and have it be economically viable? And it's a way to kind of hem in that edge. Or at least if you're not hemming it in, you're slowing things down, right? You're, you're, you're getting some balance back in the marketplace. <clears throat> so, so that's why this, this analysis that we did looking at fallowing became so important and, and part of our conversations because no one ever understood this. I mean, I think the developers did and the farmers who were at the edge did, but most of our board members are from urban areas. They didn't get it. And when they saw this, they're like, well, why does that understand? And, and you know, we had to tell the story. This is what's going on out there. So how do you start to manage that edge? And how do you start to take pressure off off of uh, the, the urban edge and, and having it grow outward. Well, part of it is through infill and redevelopment, going all the way back to the beginning of this presentation. That savings of 230,000 acres, a lot of that was accomplished through infill and redevelopment. And then where we did have to develop, we developed at much higher densities. So we would double the densities. Um, we're at about four units to the acre, we took it to eight, okay? So infill, redevelopment, increasing densities, mixing uses, all of that stuff that we did in the blueprint is taking the pressure off the edge. Yes, ma'am. Did you get the complaints from the real estate market that, you kind of alluded to it, that their buyers want the one acre? Not anymore. And, well, our buyers are still, our real estate agents are still saying that. So how do we get, it, I don't know what to tell you about that. That's a tough one. Yeah, because our commissioners and our decision makers are getting the pressure from the real estate market right. saying, we need this, you have to fulfill this demand. So how do you, know, you um, that? But that's a developer saying that. And, real, and our real estate people are saying it too, though. Yeah, you know, we have, so we were a region that was like that too. And um, we have been doing a lot of market research over the last, uh, seven, eight years, the, the market is changing dramatically, at least in the Sacramento region. People don't want a big yard. They don't need a three-car garage. They don't need 3,500 square feet. That's done. I mean, I don't want to say it's totally done, but that market is, is going away. And, you know, fortunately, the developers in our region actually see that. And they're working with us on, okay, you know, What's your survey saying this year? And they're responding. They're building at higher densities. They're building with smaller yards. They're building homes that are more affordable, meaning they're smaller. I mean, people got burned in the last market so bad that they're, they're pulling away. They don't want to be in that product anymore. Because guess where the worst property value drops were? In those suburbs. So, you know, and then people looked at that and they compared it to these higher density developments that are more centrally located and you know, where they lost 40%, this one lost 10%, and, and now is back and above what it was, you know, when the recession started. I mean, the market is, again, it's work, the market is working its magic, right? Sometimes it takes long, and sometimes we're trying to push it around, but again, it's the economy. I mean, people are, they're, they're changing their desires. And particularly because we have so many people who are retiring in our region, they're definitely not interested in that big product and all that yard to take care of. So there will always be demand for that. And I think, I would say that we have plenty of that inventory. The developers in our region see that as well. And so, you know, even lands that they had set aside for that, you know, four units to the acre, two units to the acre, they're coming back and saying, no, I'm gonna build six, I'm gonna build eight. You know, I'm replacing my golf course with a farm. That's the new trend. 
So there's there's now three developments in Sacramento that they are they're all being built around farms. There's one that's a 4,000 acre development. 10% of it is in a farm. And in fact, they're doing the farm first because guess what? They're going to make money off that farm. So they're they're following the land, getting it organically certified. And then they're going to start producing food off of it, and they're going to sell it into the, the co-op that we have in, in Sacramento. Pretty smart, especially when the housing market sucks. That's pretty smart. And there's another one that's going to do it in the north part of our region, and there's another one that's going to do it in the west part of our region. Farms are the new amenity. Golf courses are gone. It's now farms. So, I mean, I agree with you, but I, I kind of disagree. But things are different out here than they are in, in the Sacramento region. Yeah. So I think people that are leaving your area are coming here. Are coming here. <laughs> right. Because they're saying we want uh, we can't get the big ones there, so we're going to come here. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, and I've sat in multiple multiple hearings where I listened to the real estate agents or the developers say to the elected officials, "You don't need to look at the economics of it. That's our job on selling it. Ooh. You need to just look at does this land wow. use fit." Mm -hmm. I think it goes back to an engaged That's a big population mistake. and that the commissioner should be listening to their people who elected them and not as an agent. I don't, I don't think it's universal. There are a lot of developers that understand that infill and redevelopment yeah. uh, is the way, especially that the younger demographic is yeah. going. And many of the Absolutely. I mean, look what's happening in Denver right consumers. now. Yeah. Uh, Denver is just on fire. And you know, Denver was really smart. I don't mean to go on this tangent, but um, I, I, you know, it's not perfect, but I admire what Denver did because they really thought differently about how they were going to grow as a region. So at least their story is that they started with civic amenities. So they went around and they figured out what is it that we can use to attract people here, okay? So that was their, that was the first step. Let's, let's start building civic amenities, you know? museums, basketball teams, baseball teams. And then they said, then people started wanting to live in Denver. Okay, so then the business, then businesses came in and said, well, we want to be in Denver because people want to be in Denver. And so they brought in businesses. And then they built the housing. See, Sacramento, we did it, we're doing it completely backwards. We build housing, then we hope the businesses come. And if they do, then we put in the civic amenities. It doesn't work, you know? And it it's risky, right? You have to spend a lot of money. And it takes time, but if you go out to Denver and you, and you spend some time there and you talk to planners and you talk to their, their chamber of commerce and, and businesses, they did it the right way. I mean, Denver is, it's a great city. They had the blessing of a lot of built-in built infrastructure to rehab and rehab yeah. to, which really helped. Well, and the other thing is that they are the biggest metropolitan area on the front range. So, I mean, that's kind of built in too. But, Nonetheless, they could have really screwed it up. I mean, I have family there, and when I used to start, when I started visiting them when they moved out there, Denver was like Sacramento. And now it just it makes Sacramento look, you know, parochial. So, um, okay, I better speed up. I only have 15 minutes left. So no more questions back there. Um, <laughs> So, okay, so what are we doing about the edge? How are we going to manage the edge? I won't go into these details, but buffers. We need bigger buffers. I mean, that, we, that's just, it's the biggest, one of the biggest complaints is there's not enough space between this use and that use. But, but the real kicker is what are we gonna do with those buffers? And this idea of creating ag parks is very intriguing because you're getting a little bit of an urban flavor and you're getting a little bit of a rural flavor. So. Some of these, I mean, I really only know about these in California, but they are places where you see farmers growing food and you see people on swing sets. I mean, it's, it's an interesting concept. Right to farm ordinances, we have them. They're not well enforced. You know, again, if you're moving to an ag area, you're in agriculture. You're, you're gonna have dust, you're gonna have noise. They're out there harvesting those tomatoes at three in the morning because they have to. Okay, city county agreements. Getting people to, getting cities and counties to say, yes, we're going to focus our development here. The rest of the land is going to stay in agriculture. And together, we're going to figure out how we can share revenue and share opportunity. <coughs> this is happening in Yolo County. Now, Yolo County will say that they, they kind of got a bill of goods because they're not getting the kind of revenue that they expected from the cities of Davis and Woodland. But nonetheless, 
They figured out an agreement, and it's working. Yolo County has very strong policies about development goes into urban areas. Agriculture stays in our rural areas. They are, they are a poster child. Um, voter initiatives, so now in California, maybe out here too, there's a lot of counties where you cannot convert land from agriculture to an urban use without putting it on the ballot. Okay, so this works. <laughs> um, supportive zoning. So the sad example that I have is that a lot of farmers can't do value-added processing on their property because it's not zoned, it's not in the zoning ordinance. So simple things like that help with ag viability. And then of course, open space plans, easement acquisition, develop, transfer of development rights, all of these ways to basically pull the development potential off the landscape and just leave it as, as open land and, and agriculture. Okay, so it's important for agriculture, but it's also important for these environmental services. These lands provide habitat, okay? And most species in California have actually adapted to farming. Swenson's hawk is this, you know, this, this big issue in our, in our region. Well, the Swenson's hawk has adapted to field production for uh, alfalfa and for grains. They forage in those areas now. So when we talk about providing habitat for Swenson's hawk, the plans aren't to fallow the land and let it go natural. The plans are keep it in, in alfalfa, and we're going to pay you to do that. Okay, water resources. Flood control, carbon sequestration, air quality, look at this. Urban land is 70 times, produces 70 times more greenhouse gases than agricultural land, okay? California has 80-32 and it's in its climate change objectives. Just keep the land in agriculture, okay? So what we're getting at is this concept of working landscapes. And we're, we're going to be putting a lot of energy into this because of the fact that we, we see that there's not only environmental opportunity, but there's economic opportunity as well. All of these are services, and there's a market for these services, and it's just it's up to us to quantify what the market is and then use that as a way to drive a new economy around agriculture, working landscapes, and environmental services. And people are paying for those, they just don't know it. Okay. Um, well, I told you I was going to do this, so I'll do it. Again. I'll do it. Um, this fiscal model is really important, okay? And why? It's really, this is, this is the key bullet here. Most communities see growth of any kind as economic development. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, this is a bad treadmill to be on. Just because you just built a thousand units doesn't mean you're now going to be, everything's going to be fine in your community. What we're finding is things actually get worse. You get the shot in the arm, you get these revenues, you know, you start to cover some of those costs that we're building up, and then guess what? You have to provide services, you have to maintain the infrastructure. You, you just can't get off that treadmill. So what we're trying to do is help these communities understand how to be better balanced. So balanced communities leads to better balanced sheets. And here's why. If you look at these individual products, they don't pay for themselves, okay? So medium density, even medium density residential is, it, this, this one is your revenues are actually covering your costs. So all of these products that are pretty standard products in, in these small communities don't pay for themselves. You don't see any office space in small communities these, these days because there's no businesses located there. So there's not much of that. Regional retail, that's an urban product. That's not a that's not a rural product. And mixed use. Look at the look at the return on mixed use. So you know, um, as a rural community, these are going to be tough. These are easy, but they don't make any money. And this one actually works. We have communities that are starting to embrace this in our region, and their downtowns are pretty darn cool. Small little communities that have have this, this density, and it creates a vibrant community. And look at what they get. They actually get revenue that covers costs. What, what are you referring to as mixed use there? What? Um, housing over retail, 
um, housing over office, things like that. One and one and one. Uh, pardon me, two to three story buildings. Um, you know, people are rehabbing these old buildings that are two and three stories, and they're turning them into apartments. Um, sometimes uh, condominiums, um, and it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be that integrated product. It can also be horizontal mixed use. The trick is you've got to you've got to start mixing up densities and uses within an urban within a within a small area, because the way that the model works is that when you have more intense uses on top of an acre of land. Yeah, the cost of the infrastructure is higher on that acre than it would be for low density uses, but the cost per unit goes down substantially. So that, see, that's what people don't think about. They say, well, that's more expensive. It's not more expensive. It's more expensive physically in the ground, but when you put it, when you think about what's on top of it and everything that you're serving, it's actually far less expensive. And so that's what we're talking about. And you know, again, a lot of these communities are in areas where the more land in production, the more opportunity they have for, for commerce. And so, you know, it's this balancing act of, we're not saying don't grow, you know, we're just saying be smart about it. There's a development in Haley, for example. Um, I want to say it's Scott, they do their marketing and some research and development there. And they built a three-story building and the bottom level is the office and the manufacturing and the retail, not retail, but it's for their salesmen come to work out of. Second floor is actually low income housing. You have to be within a certain salary range in order to be able to purchase one of those units. Top floor, penthouses, <laughs> mega bucks. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's yeah, what Now, was that new construction or yeah. rehab? No, brand new construction within the last two yeah. years in Haiti. I mean, I'm not saying it's easy because it's a whole different way of doing business, but we do. They have, we have one community in particular in our region, the city of Winters, and they they have embraced this entirely. I mean, they are all about looking back inward. Um, they they will have a few subdivisions at their edge, but they are concentrating on their downtown, and it's cool. It's a great little community, and people now drive out there to go spend time walking basically at like three blocks because there are art galleries, there are wineries. There's a there's a a club that has music on the B circuit. There's a fantastic restaurant. There's actually a couple of fantastic restaurants. I mean, it's it's a hopping little town now. When I was in college and we used to drive out there, we would go out there because they would serve you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, payback period. This is you know as as an economic planner, this one is really important. Okay, these products, these kind of sprawl sprawl patterns, take a hundred years to pay off the infrastructure. When you start looking inward, you know, downtown focus and mixed use, I mean, mixed use in particular, 30 years to pay off, okay? So pretty big difference here. This is the kind of stuff that we're trying to help communities understand so that they can make decisions, better decisions about how they're growing. Look, and we're not saying do this. We're just saying here's the information. Do with it what you may. If you, if you want this stuff, fine. But understand that it's going to take you a while to pay that off. The revenues coming out of that development don't pay for the costs as quickly as you would if you did something like this. And the other, I threw this in here because I think this is really important. Broadband access is what's going to help diversify these economies in, in these rural areas. And at least for us, we don't have good broadband access in our small communities. And so the more we have this, the more we get things like telehealth and telemedicine, distance learning, public safety, but this is a big one, access to markets, okay? That's big, and when you, have, when you have this technology out in the rural landscape, now you can start using all this high-tech, um, all these high-tech devices in your production. Water monitoring, right? How much energy are you using in your pumps, right? All this stuff becomes possible, but that requires broadband. Okay, so I only have five minutes, so I'm gonna I'm gonna buzz through this transportation stuff, but I'm also gonna end on this. So, so all of this comes home when we talk about the main role that we have as a metropolitan planning organization. That we take this information, we work with our elected officials, we work with economic development, 
uh, folks, we work with the private sector to figure out what's happening in our region and where are we going. Because we use that information then to figure out what's the st most strategic use for our transportation dollars. Okay, here are our problems. Here are our challenges. Our roads are getting urbanized, and I'll show you this in a second. Creating more accidents and conflicts. Farm workers are having a hard time getting to their job site. And our road standards and maintenance schedules just aren't keeping up. Okay, so this idea of rural mobility is kind of becoming you know, a big, big problem in our region that we just cannot keep up with the demand out there. So this is what a typical rural road looks like in our region, right? About four o'clock in the morning, you start seeing all this activity out there, and it's pretty steady throughout the day, and then it drops off at night. Makes sense, right? You get up, you go plow your field, you drive your truck around, you go to your different sites, that's what you're seeing, okay? This is also a rural road. And we're starting to see more and more of this in our region where you have people commuting in the morning. Okay, they commute in the morning, and then it drops off, and then they commute in the evening. And this is happening to all of the, the major rural corridors are becoming urbanized. And so, guess what's happening? We're now seeing more accidents out there. This is kind of a little twisted, but these are all the ways that you can be killed on a rural road in our, in our region. Okay. And when you look at the fact that we're 13% of the population is rural, but 44% of the, of the fatal accidents happen in rural areas, that imbalance is a problem. And so, you know, we're not talking about, uh, you know, a small difference here. We're talking about a pretty major trend that um, we need to figure out how to fix. Again, I mentioned farm workers. They need to get to their job site. We now, fortunately, we have a van pool service that takes them out there cost them less money, it's very reliable. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we're starting to work on. One of the main things that we're doing is we're, we're trying to identify the corridors that are most important, not only for moving farm products to market, but also because of safety, okay? So farm to market routes are really, really important, but they're also important because we have market to farm activity. People driving out to go and, and enjoy agritourism sites, wine tasting, farm stays. You know, a lot of families are taking their kids out now to, to farms because they want them to understand farming. So we have a lot more activity out there than we used to have. And the roads are not designed to handle that kind of volume. So we're putting all this together to come up with uh, strategies in our region that we can target where we want to put our funding and try to address these problems of, of access, mobility, and safety. The Port of West Sacramento is also an important part of this transportation infrastructure because this is how we're getting our product out to international markets. So, you know, I want to I want to kind of be fair to all modes of transportation out there. This one is really important and getting more important in our region. But here's the problem: forty-eight percent of the road miles in our region, almost half of the road miles, are rural. But because of the population being only at 13%, we only have about 13% of the money to actually spend on those roads. So half of our roads only get 13% of the money. So, you know, we're locked into these formulas. So it makes it important for us to be creative and strategic about how we spend that money and, you know, what we're going to do to make sure that we improve safety and, and mobility in, in our rural areas. So, you know, our rural communities are at a disadvantage. It's just baked in. Um, and even though we have come up with this funding guide to help them, you know, it, it still is, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, we do have discretionary money, and we can spend that where we want to, and more and more, we're trying to figure out how we can do it out here. It's tough, though, because again, 13% of the population. You know, it's hard to then say, well, no, we're not gonna put money into fixing potholes in town because we think it's important for 13% of the population to have you know, nice, nice new roads. It's, that's a tough sell, but we're trying. <clears throat> okay, last slide, but maybe one of the most important is regulations. Um, they can help or hurt. And you know, in California, if, if my friend was still here, I would, I would get back on my soapbox and talk about the value of regulations, the fact that California products are in high demand because they're clean, right? They are high quality products. Now, 
it's tough to get there and it's expensive, but those, those production regulations are important for reducing chemical residue, reducing water demand, um, cleaning up the air. Those are all good things that go along with it, but they're also expensive. And so what we're looking for is a way to achieve those objectives, but not do it in such a stringent environment where it's costing the growers more and more money to do that and costing the processors more and more money to do that. We're losing processing in California, and it's because they can find cheaper places to do business. And as I said earlier, the market is dictating what standards are, are to be set for the products going into onto plates for the consumers, and those standards are pretty darn high. So you don't necessarily need those kinds of regulations today. Um, again, I'm not saying they're not important. I think it's we just need to strike a better balance. So we're looking for permit streamlining opportunities. We're looking for regulatory reform opportunities. And again, we're always going to keep in our sights that we do have environmental objectives that we think are important and that we want to meet. But there's got to be a cheaper way to do that. So with that, um, I hope I answered all the questions that you had. I guess it's time to go, but I will stick around if you have more questions. So thank you for your time.